in these the closing days of time, what joy the glorious hope affords, that soon a wondrous truth sublime, he shall reign King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as the hymnologist declares it. Thorough Harris, that the Lord is coming very soon. It is imperative, therefore, brethren, that we pay attention to the things that are required for us to be successful in our journey, especially at this time, because the coming of our Master, the Lord Jesus, draweth nigh. Truth is that the signs around us in earth and air or painted on the starlit sky, God's faithful witnesses need to declare it that the coming of the Savior draws nigh. And as we come close to the return of the Lord Jesus for the bride, amen, for those that are blood-washed and blood-bought, those that are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins and have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, living and moving and having his being. And walking in obedience with him, so long as we are under God's tutelage and following his guidance, then we should expect his glorious appearing any day now, any moment now in any season. As we come close to this time, we realize that the adversaries of our souls are more built and tilt towards destroying us. And as we have been studying from last week, uh, the kingdom resistance, we have come to understand the function and the power of ignorance, deception, and disobedience. And this week, we are still under the general concept of disobedience, but a profound manifestation of it is in what we call rebellion. And so the kingdom of God is under violent opposition, and one of the avenues from which the adversary opposes the kingdom of God is to incite rebellion. It's to promote the uh, de destruction from within, discord, disunity, uh, which seeks to bring the heirs of the kingdom out of alignment with the will and desire of the king, thereby causing them not to be able to fulfill the mandate of heaven, the mandate over their lives, and the mandate for the church on the earth. And so we must pay keen attention to the elements of rebellion and the elements of disobedience, both in our own hearts, as well as in the church, as well as in this world at large. As Jesus told the disciples, speaking to Peter in particular, that the kingdom of heaven basically is invincible. As Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We must understand and we embrace the fact that whatever God has established cannot be destroyed and can in no way be rendered void. Whatever God has declared must come to pass. And so he has told us many truths concerning the kingdom of heaven and concerning his will. And concerning our lives on earth. And they are inalterable. His words cannot change. They will come to pass. So the kingdom of heaven and of God suffers violence. But the violence take it by force. Yes. And we know that this is true. As the word of the Lord says. That from the days of John the Baptist even until now. Amen. There is resistance against the kingdom of God and of heaven. And that resistance manifests itself in so many ways. And we're just dealing with a few of them in this study. And it's by no means meant to be exhaustive, but it's meant to stimulate an understanding and to encourage and cultivate actions that will bring us more fruit in the kingdom of God. And these are some of the things we must watch against. So we have to watch against rebellion. The gates of hell will never prevail against the kingdom of God. The gates of hell will never prevail against the church, the ecclesia, the called out government of God in the earth. It cannot, for the master has said it. But we must understand, like the children of Israel, right? The promises of God are given unto them. Uh, that God is going to establish them, that he will never cast them off, that he will never forget them. Amen. They are the apple of his eye, indeed. But in every generation, those that are in, walk in disobedience to the word of God, they perish in their time. 
but the covenantal promises of God are upheld, not by them, but by the generations that follow them. So we must be mindful that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But if you and I do not walk in alignment with the terms and the powers of the kingdom of God, which are the prerogative of the church, we will find that they prevail against us as individuals. Our obedience to the kingdom of God and to the word of God is critical, right? So long as we are in the kingdom, yes, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us as a function of us being a part of the kingdom. But if we step outside of the kingdom of God through disobedience and eh, walking by our own rule and by our own order, then we will find that the gates of hell will prevail against us because we are not under the protection and under the provisions of the kingdom of heaven. So let us not just take it to say that, okay, the gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. And, you know, I am a part of the church. If our lives are not in alignment with what God has required of us, then we are in jeopardy. We must walk in obedience to the will and the covenants of God. So rebellion against God, you know, embraces three, three main things in my estimation and in my study of it. It embraces the idolatry of self. When uh, an entity or a person rebels against God, they are really idolizing themselves because in, in, in actuality, what one is saying by such a, an act or such acts of rebellion is that I am more important than God or that I have a greater standard than God or that I don't need to answer to God. So, uh, as we will see this in the rant of Lucifer, as is recorded in the writings of Isaiah, right? When we rebel against God, we also embrace Satan, the God of this world. We embrace the one in whom rebellion was first found or recorded as found in him, right? We embrace Satan, and all that is in Satan is incorrigible, right? He, he will never be corrected. He will never be righted. He is eternally damned and corrupted for all of time and for all of eternity, which is ahead of us. So he being the father of rebellion and he being the father of lies to amen. Whenever we walk in rebellion against God, we come into alignment with the kingdom of Satan. We come into alignment with Satan and that which is of Satan cannot be in agreement with that which is of God. The third element that we embrace when we rebel against God is the world because Satan of course being the God of this world and by his deceit uh, and his control over man and all that uh, has to do with man in terms of his influence of evil then the things that are in the world are bent under the influence of the Luciferian system and thereby is in rebellion against God too right so the systems of the world, you know, the, that operate by the lust of the eye and the, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and these things that are in the world that draw us and that fight and combat with the kingdom of God in us as children of God are in alignment with Lucifer, are in alignment with Satan. So when we embrace rebellion, we are embracing that which has to do with Satan, that which has to do with the world and that which has to do with ourselves. And this is at the very crux of it. And it starts for the human experience with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Whatever Eve thought to herself uh, as to what Lucifer was telling her to do concerning the fruit had to deal with her sense of her self-perception. Yes, uh, so she wants to know. I want to know what God is hiding from me. And I believe the same thing affected Adam. Amen. We can get all uh, novel and, and, and cute with this, but... I desire not to do so. Adam was deceived. Adam, Adam uh, blatantly disobeyed God. Eve was deceived, right? Adam wasn't deceived. He was just disobedient. And so when you look at the narrative, you realize that the interest of the human uh, drove them to disobey God, to rebel against God, the self-driven interest. Uh, so we have got to watch for that. The adultery of self is very prone to it. When men or any created entity rebels against God, they, in, in, in theory and fundamentally, rebel against the very cause and construct of their existence, right? 
And when you rebel, when you go against the foundations of your own existence, you are, in essence, destroying yourself. So when any entity or any human being rebel against God, you're rebelling against the creator, your creator, your architect, your God, the one out of whom you proceed. Amen. When you rebel against your source, you are destroying yourself. So we must be very careful that we ensure by obedience to the word of God that we do not walk in rebellion. For whenever we do that, we are destroying ourselves. We are without question. So a few things to think on. Uh, rebellion started with Lucifer. It started with, amen, Satan. Uh, he, he was in the heaven of God. He was in the presence of the Lord Most High. And then iniquity was found in his heart uh, or pride. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 11 through 17, the Bible says, Thy pump is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, and the worm is spread unto thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yea, my God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. This here is a record of what went on in the great beyond the before human existence, where Lucifer rebelled against God. It is believed here that the Genesis 1 verse 1 and 1 verse 2, the gap theory, that the earth was perfectly made and was under the rulership of Lucifer and, and a host of angels, those that were given to his charge. And that at some point, Lucifer rebelled against God by desiring to be as God. He was intoxicated with his own sense of magnanimity and grandiosity. He just figured that Oh, I will be as the most high. As you see here in the scripture, I will ascend into heaven of God. So the, the, the great eyes, right? I will ascend. I will exalt. I will sit. Uh, I will ascend above the heights. I will be like the most high. You know, just a focus on self, on the individual, the idolatry of himself, the worship of himself, right? Giving homage to himself as if though he's some self-generating entity. no. Everything that is made by God is made for his purpose and is under God. And every authority and dominion and power and entity that is made and that is, ever was made is under God's rulership and direction and answer to the most high God. So we see where Lucifer got carried away with himself here and that he desired the place of God and declared what he would do. And any time there is rebellion in the kingdom of God, God has an answer for it. So in the heaven of God, when Lucifer rebelled, the fact is that there was found no place for repentance for him. And for those angels that defected with him, there was no place found. Uh, as it is recorded in the word, God will have mercy on whom he'll have mercy. And he will pardon whom he'll pardon. And he will judge whom he'll judge. Who at any time can uh, step up to the face and the place of God and argue with the justness of his actions. Amen. With the moral uh, turpitude of his decisions. Who? Who has the capacity to do that? So God has chosen not to extend mercy to Lucifer. And it is a very chilling uh, kind of a sin here that he commits, which is rebellion. He rebels against God. And so Lucifer's sin of rebellion has found no place of repentance. And no place of forgiveness in the eyes of God. Yes. And so we see where this rebellion against God started in heaven. Started with Lucifer. And the Bible says in Genesis 1-2. Amen. That the earth was without form and, without, and was void. It seemed to have to do with 
Satan, it's believed, you know, in his rebellion and his rant against God, he went ballistic and destroyed the place since it was under his rulership and under his power. Uh, but God came and God renovated the earth, so to speak, as it's believed. Amen. Uh, so God recreated, for want of uh, a better expression, the earth. Right. So in the beginning was the was the earth. Amen. Uh, and it was formless and void and God remade it. So the idea is here that uh, Lucifer's most prominent manifestations among men will be through the form of a man. Right. So if you notice uh, in verse. One, it says that thy pump is brought down to the grave. This is speaking of a human entity. And the noise of thy vials, and the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. He's speaking about a human being. So from time to time, you have these human beings that are possessed by the devil, these great leaders and others, and so they are brought low. But the judgment against them is really the judgment against Lucifer. And if you notice, in the end, he will be brought down to hell, and he will be relegated to punishment. So, you know, there, there are lots of nuggets here in the scripture, praise God, but we will move on. So the rebellion started with Satan. Lucifer started the rebellion, right? So uh, any, any time we walk in rebellion. So notice he wanted to take the place of God. He wanted to exalt himself where God alone is to be exalted. And we have to be careful of this. Uh, our thoughts, our ideas, what we think is right, even in the name of God. What we think is, is, is correct. Who we think should be elevated. Who, so in terms of God's actions, God's decisions, God's determinations, we must know our place. That which is not within our scope and our power to determine or to affect, we must know our place. Lucifer lost sight of what his place was. And he wanted to be and do what God never gave him to do and or to be. And so whenever we begin to think that we determine what we do by our own will and by our own capacities, and we determine what should be done uh, in other experiences too. We are stepping in the place of God. And we are trying to be as God. And we have to be very careful of such an error. So rebellion undermines the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, as it is manifested in the earth. And, and this is flowing out of the Luciferian idea that I will replace God. So the order of God must be fought and the order of God must be resisted, both in heaven and in earth. Lucifer couldn't do it in heaven. He is kicked out, right? Jesus spoke about it. I beheld Lucifer, Satan fall as lightning to the earth, right? And war unto them. Amen. So uh, where God is, it's not entertained. It's removed. It's rejected and it will be punished. This is a lesson for us. We must be careful. So rebellion undermines a few things. Uh, seriously. It undermines authority. Whenever there is a state of rebellion, uh, there is a, a sense of an anarchy against the established authority. So uh, when people walk in rebellion, when entities walk in rebellion, they undermine the authority of leadership, of government. They have problems with it. And we must watch for this in our own spirit. Amen. Nothing is wrong with uh, having a difference of opinion, but one must always understand that the will of God trumps all. The will of God is above all, and our understanding is limited, and our faculties are limited. In fact, we're only here for between 70 to 100 years. How are we going to affect the cosmos, and how are we going to determine what God should do and or say in his kingdom? We must be very careful. So uh, those that walk in rebellion, they undermine authority. They question authority. They question leadership. Amen. They, they know a better way. Now, if there is an error, if there's things that are out of alignment, anybody uh, who has sight can see when the light is turned off or see when something is going afoot. But everything must be uh, appropriated based on how God has said it is to be dealt with, based on how God has said it is to be ordered and is to be uh, handled. So those who walk in rebellion, amen, they question the authority of God, not just in terms of uh, public governance or in terms of the church environment, but they question the, the governance of their own life. So they take the reign of their own life and they determine how their life will go without the input of God. Uh, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, right? Proverbs 3 verse 5, and lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, right? And he shall direct thy path. Those that walk in rebellion undermine the authority of God over our lives. We were created for his pleasure. 
we were designed to give him glory. And whenever we walk driven and directed by our own ethos, by our own codes, by our own determinations, we are, in effect, undermining God's authority over our lives, right? And this concept is brought forward, amen, to places of worship, to business places, to uh, the entire human race. Rebellion undermines unity. So there was unity in heaven before Lucifer defected. And he, through his rebellion against God, convinced one third the host of angels, right, to align with him. And what he did was created a duality in heaven. Uh, you had what God says and you have what Lucifer says, right? So it creates disunity. And disunity brings about dysfunction. Because wherever there is not a singularity of mindset, where there is just a oneness of ideas and a oneness of mind, you find that resources are split, right? Purposes are, are sabotaged and energies are focused in directions that it should not be. If you notice, we as human beings, we're not given two heads, we're given one. We have two eyes, but we have one focus, right? We have two ears, but we have one uh, sonar capacity to, to focus on one voice at any one uh, and given time. So rebellion uh, undermines unity. And we find this wherever, whenever you're dealing with a team, right? And you, if you have any experience with this, you, you must be a part of a team at some place or point in your life. Yes. So those who are in rebellion, they create disunity, disjunction, amen, plurality. And what happens is that uh, a different agenda draws away from whatever the team has been assigned to do. So when somebody is rebelling uh, against uh, the order or an organization, uh, amen, you find that they want to pursue their own things, their own agenda, or go about the, the, the so-called agenda their own way. And what happens is that you don't get a lot done and the team is negatively affected by these kinds of rebellion. Now, when you look at it at a personal level, when you and I come to understand that God has a purpose for our lives, that he designed us to be certain things in this earth and he allows free agency. Yes, he allows us to choose uh, how we do things. He allows us to choose whether we obey him or not. All right. And in our obedience of him, he allows us parameters to choose how we do things, right? We are not androids, we are not robots, we are not mindless creatures. But within the parameters of our ability to choose, we must choose as it relates to what God has designed and the framework in which God has designed us to operate. So, uh, brethren, this is very critical. This is very critical for us to understand, right? So, when we now go by our own order and by our own will, we are not operating with the mandate of heaven. And so what God has designed to work for you will not work for you because you're not operating based on how God has said you are to operate. And this, this, this junction of your will and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God's will will show us that we will live our lives. And many do live their lives their way. As Frank Sinatra is known to say, he did it his way, right? And the Bible says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof, you know, it's not good. Death and hell and destruction and all the bad stuff because our perceptions are limited. So we go and we live our way and we spend our time, our years, our resources, our intellect, our faculties doing things our way that are not in alignment with God. And you notice, we end up without God. We end up in punishment. Many are, have died. Millions, billions of people have died. And they are gone to a crisis eternity. Why? Because they were not in unity with what God had determined for their lives. Right? God determined that none of us should perish. He, God's will is that no human being live an aimless life and live a purposeless life. The will of God is that every one of us live a purpose-driven and a purpose-directed life. The will of God is that we come to him as the source. As Adam was expected to deal with the most high as the source in the garden of Israel. The source of wisdom, source of health, source of strength, source of knowledge, source of understanding. God intends for us to come to him as a source and to be directed by him as our source. Now when there is rebellion, we walk away from that and we find disunity and dysfunction. And, and, and when, you, when it relates to the church, for example, now the church of God, the assembly of God to which we are a part, when we walk in divergence as to what God has established as the order, 
We fatigue the kingdom of God's manifestation in our world and in our time. And if we continue in this, God will remove us, just as he's admonished uh, to the seven churches of Asia Minor uh, in the book of the Revelation. He says, if you don't change, I will come quickly, for example, and I will remove your candlestick. Amen. If you notice too, today, in today's day, right, which, which um, in today's day, none of those seven churches are still existent. They are, they are gone. Now, the will of God is that the church will continue in its weakness in a place, right? Uh, but when men don't align with God, we will be removed from our places. And I'm, I'm not purporting by any measure that they never repented. We, 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 we don't see it. I, I haven't been able to examine any evidence to the uh, end that these churches followed what God said they were to do. But the point is that if we don't align ourselves with the will of God, we will not come to a good end because we have to make a choice. We are either led by ourselves and the Luciferian agency or we are led by God. So rebellion undermines the will of God for a man in the earth in broad strokes, thereby uh, undermining the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven on earth. So God is king eternally mortal. He is the invisible God. In every kingdom, there is a king. He is the king. In every kingdom has laws. The law is the word of God, the will of God, expressed in the written word, which is the Bible, expressed in the speaking word to the Holy Spirit. Amen. The kingdom of God operates by the will of the king of kings. When you do not walk in alignment with the will of the king of kings, you are in rebellion against the kingdom of God. And you side with the adversarial forces of Satan and the world that are opposing the kingdom of heaven and of God on earth. So brethren, be careful what you think you're doing in the name of God. You must be careful. Be careful what you are doing. Amen. Uh, uh, in your own mindset, figuring you're doing the work of God. No, if what you're doing is not in alignment with the word of God, you're not working for God. You can be doing, uh, 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 you can be motivated out of a right passion, but your actions are wrong. And so we must be careful that whatever we do, whatever we think, whatever we promote, whatever we use as our rule of thumb for our actions must have its roots in the word of God, in the expressed will of God. You cannot be doing something wrong in the name of standing up for the right. You must be careful. Amen. Watch for this. It's, it's very powerfully deceptive of the devil to use that. So now rebellion against God, right? is rooted in a profound misconception of one's worth and powers. When you find that rebellion is taking root in your own heart, or when you look at the life of somebody else and see that they are walking in rebellion against God, right? You see they are not in accordance with what God's word is saying, whether in terms of their moral compass as it relates to their lives, as it relates to uh, the purity of their bodies, the purity of their minds, amen, whether they are giving heed to the lust of the flesh and walking in sexual sins or, or walking in other sins of, amen, the lust of the eye, for example, amen. Uh, when you look into these and you find that a person is in rebellion, that means they are bent, they are pitted their lives in a way that is against God's will. You will find misconception of one's worth and powers. Go back to Lucifer, right, in Isaiah. Satan thought that he had the power to be as God. He thought he had the capacity to take God's position. So he figured that he was all that and more. And no way he's not. And so you find that rebellion uh, takes root in the hearts of those that have not the appropriate sense of who they are. You must have an appropriate sense of your self-worth. Can you cause the stars to sing? Can you create or make anything from nothing? Uh, do you have the ability to be as God? Amen. We must ask ourselves the question, what am I doing? Am I saying that I'm better than God? Am I saying that I know more than God? Am I saying that I'm correcting God? Uh, do I think uh, too much of myself? The Bible says we must esteem others more highly than ourselves, right? It is a rule of thumb. It's, it's meant to help us to humble ourselves. Don't think of yourself in lofty terms above others. Amen. Uh, preferring yourself because this will puff you up and cause you to become proud and arrogant. Amen. And supercilious. Amen. So 
rebellion is rooted in a profound sense of one's, a misconception of one's worth. You ought to know, Lucifer should have known that he was a created entity. He should have known that the Most High is the Almighty. He should have understood, amen, for however long he was in existence, that the powers that he wielded, they flowed from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Sovereign One. Amen. But we must be careful now to guard our hearts because this misconstrued sense of self's worth and powers, amen, finds its room in the heart, in the passions, and in the intellect of the individuals that are affected by rebellion. Rebellion against God is also rooted in a profound lack of knowledge and understanding of God. For if we truly knew who God is, uh, and, and I must, uh, you know, mitigate that statement somehow, uh, because that which can be known of God is revealed by God to men, right? The invisible things of him are from the creation of the world, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, Romans 1.20. So God reveals himself to man. Man cannot apprehend God on his own, right? God has to reveal himself to us. So anything that God has revealed to us is our prerogative. It's ours. So God has revealed himself as the creator of the ends of the universe. That knowledge is our prerogative. God has revealed himself as the almighty, amen, the omnipotent, the omniscient, the omnibenevolent one, he has revealed himself as uh, through the Jehovahistic manifestations of the children of Israel and thereby to the world. So when one does not have correct knowledge of God, you are prone to walk in rebellion. When you don't understand that every power that is flows from God and, that, and operates by the authority of God and the authorization of God, so to speak, then you will get ahead of yourself. When you bear in mind that you are under authority, no matter how powerful you are. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. Amen. The great leader, amen, of Babylon. Right? God put him down, uh, turned him into a human ox for seven years. Why? Because he got carried away with himself. Uh, look at this great Babylon that I have built. The eye, the eye, the this, the eye, the eye, the eye, the eye. Uh, I think uh, in that uh, behaviorism, Nebuchadnezzar was a good manifestation of someone under the power of Lucifer, under the influence of Satan. And notice what God did. God lowered him down to the dirt to bring him into knowledge of who God is and to understand of how God operate and for him to know who he is too. Yes. So when one is in rebellion against God, there is a profound lack of knowledge of God. That is why we need to know him. We need to search him out. We need to seek that which is already revealed concerning the Almighty God. Amen. And direct our behavior by that knowledge. My brethren and friends, amen. We need to know him. In John 17, 3, Jesus pray uh, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. His divine power, 2 Peter 1, 3, has given us everything for life uh, and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us unto glory and virtue. Amen. Whom to know is life eternal. We need to know God. Right? Amen. We need to know him and have the correct knowledge of him. Rebellion is sustained by doubt too. Uh, concerning the inerrance of God's word and the pure inalterable attributes of God. When we walk in rebellion, whenever you find rebellion, and whenever you see it is sustained, amen, there is doubt concerning the word of God. Because uh, not everything concerning God is revealed to us, right? And so God has revealed enough upon which we can build our faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. The direct word of God to man in his situation for his circumstances. So... When people walk in rebellion and when we find that we walk in rebellion, there is some measure of doubt concerning God's word, right? Uh, God says that he that exalted himself shall be abased, right? Uh, he that abated himself shall be exalted. God says he will never share his glory with another. He says there is none with him, there is none beside him, there is no other God before him. Amen. And if there can be an after him, there shall be none. When we rebel against God in terms of our actions in our lives, Right? 
such as God telling us, don't go there. Move to, uh, I don't know, uh, Austria. Uh, God is telling you, don't uh, build your house there. God is telling you, don't get married to that person. God is telling you, amen, uh, where to do what and what profession. And we, we, we disregard the instructions of God, the leadership of God in our lives. It's because we doubt that God knows what's best for us. It's because we doubt that whatever we do, God is going to cause us to reap the merits of it, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It's because there is doubt as to the fact that there can be no potentate that can override God's word. When we walk in sin and we live in ungodliness, uh, figuring that there is no such thing as heaven, there's no such thing as earth, and that when we die, we are finished, is because there is doubt as to what God's word has already declared. There is a heaven, there is a hell, there is life after death. Amen. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Hebrews 9 27. There is doubt concerning God's word, right? And the fact of who God is. God will never change. He never allows rebellion to go unchecked. God has a plan, and everything is going to function by the order of God's plan. So we've got to watch for that. And so rebellion is also sustained by stubbornness, uh, intransigence, the, on, the, the, the lack of willingness to change, willingness rather, to change one's thought or actions, right? Stubbornness, uh, the, the, this very profound sense of doing what you want to do regardless of what is otherwise indicated as being smart or sensible to do. When God told, uh, for example, King Saul, amen, that he should kill all the Amalekites and he should let nothing remain and shouldn't take any spoils. Uh, with the mouth of the prophet had told him, amen. And he went there and did what he felt like doing. In spite the consternation, in spite the warning, in spite God leading and directing him to do the right thing, the king decided he's gonna do his own thing. And as a result of that, what happened? God rejected him as being king. And his entire bloodline was cut off, right, because of rebellion. So rebellion uh, comes up against the kingdom of God in a very profound way. So rebellion against God loves company. So, you know, it's like a disease. It's like a virus. It's like, you know, some pathogen. Whenever there is rebellion, rebellion seeks company. Lucifer rebelled against God. And how did he get one third the host of heaven to follow him? How did the one third of the stars, how, how did they follow him, Lucifer? Right? Is because he rebellion loves company. And so rebellion has its own doctrine. It has its own uh, mission. And so it will seek followers to come into alignment with rebellion. You know, rebellion actually embraces unity. It embraces teamwork. Amen. It embraces discipline. But against God. Away from God. So you got to watch for those that are champion of, championing a cause that is not validated by the word of God. Watch those that want you to agree with something that is in direct contravention of the word of God, the will of God. Watch for those that are intoxicated with their own sense of rightness, amen, that they don't care what word of God they violate. They are so taken up with what they believe to be true and what they believe to be right, regardless of how the word of the Lord says that such actions are wrong and are against God. Right? So rebellion loves company. Oh, those who like to walk against God's will love company. Look at the world. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction. Why is it broad? To accommodate the hosts that are going. Many there be that walk. It's easy to walk in rebellion against God. It is difficult to walk in obedience. Amen. And from a human self-generated uh, angle. Without the spirit of God, it is difficult to walk in obedience to the Lord, to the word of God. But with the help of God, amen, it is easy to submit me to the will of God. No matter how the flesh fights, once you uh, listen to the voice of God and obey him, then it becomes easy. So rebellion loves company. Lucifer had one third go with him. Amen. In rebellion against God. Uh, Nimrod had a whole host of people helping him to build a tower of Babel. Amen. In defiance to the express counsel of God in the earth. Yes. Uh, you watch them, jamerys and jamborees. Eh? You watch them throughout the, the canon of the Bible. Those that walk in rebellion seems often to get a lot of people to side with them. Don't watch the numbers. 
Watch what God says. Don't watch how many people think something is true. Watch what God says. Don't look at how many people think something is right. Look at what the word of God says. The other thing about rebellion is that it justifies actions. When a person is walking in rebellion, they are convinced of their rightness, of their correctness, of the, the inerrant, so to speak, of their way. Right? Rebellion justifies its actions. There, it's logical. This doesn't make sense. Therefore, this makes sense. Amen. I can't see. Therefore, I do. Watch for it. Justification of actions. And we find this in our own heart. Anytime we want to go against the will of God, we seek to justify our actions. We know something is wrong. We know it's ungodly. We know it's not according to the will of God. But we try to rationalize it and thereby justify it. Amen. Watch for it. Ah, uh, Eve looked at the fruit and said, mm, it looks good to eat. Amen. Why would God say don't eat this fruit? Trying to justify the action. Uh, Adam tried to do it. It's the woman that you gave me. I didn't do it. She brought it up. And I just went with the flow. Amen. Uh, rebellion seeks to justify its actions. Uh, rebellion advances lies and deceit. Rebellion hates the truth. Because the truth will require alignment. If something is true, why would you want to live according to something that's other than truth, right? Uh, if you save your money, amen, you will, you will have a good life eventually, all right? And you say, oh, that's true, so I'm going to live by it. So I save my money, and you see whether or not it's true in your life. Now, uh, if I live my way, if I do things my way, I'll have a happy life. Uh, but God says that at the end of that, my so-called happy life will be bitterness will be anguish, will be eternal damnation and punishment. So you have to watch for rebellion. It advances lies. And a lie is just a lie. It doesn't matter how much measure of facts it has or elements of truth it has. So once it is not totally true, it is a lie. So rebellion advances lies, misconception, right? Misinformation. Rebellion loves to take the truth and twist it and pollute the truth and cause it thereby to become a lie, right? So watch, watch for lies in your own lives. Watch for lies. You lie to yourself, amen, about uh, the correctness of your actions. You lie to yourself about the, 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 the outcome of your actions. You lie to yourself as to the motivations of your actions. You and I know, amen, if you should look in your own heart, whenever you rebel against God, you'll find that you see company in it. You'll find that you try to justify it. You'll find that there is some lie at the foundation of your thought process that allows you to walk in rebellion against God, right? Rebellion also utilizes manipulation, amen? Manipulation of your senses, manipulation of information, manipulation of your understanding and your resources and so on and so forth, right? Lucifer manipulated Eve's understanding of God's word and brought her into rebellion, right? This is very, very powerful to understand. Lucifer was trying to manipulate Jesus' understanding when he was tempting him, amen, in the wilderness. He tried to manipulate his, his understanding of what needs to be done, how, when, and where. Amen, cast thyself down because uh, angels have charge over you, eh? Yes, angels have charge over you lest you dash your foot against your st a stone. You should not go seek to tempt God, amen. Rebellion is promoted and practiced by the world of darkness. Everything that is of the devil promotes rebellion against God. God made Adam and Eve. He made man and a woman. This world is promoting, amen, homosexuality. It is not of God. It is not promoted by God. God doesn't like it. It is an abomination. But this world promotes it. And says it's right, it's okay, freedom of choice, there is no God, you have, you have a whole, you have the full gamut of this. God, from, 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 from the most profound uh, lie and corruption of it, to say that God is okay with it, it is the church that has a problem with homosexuality. To the next variation of it, to say there is no God, and you can do what you want to do, because ain't nothing wrong with it, it feels right, do it. Right? Manipulation of your senses, manipulation of your resources, manipulation of the understanding. Homosexuality is, a, is, a, is an inappropriation of what God has designed to be the construct of the family, the construct of uh, procreation, the construct of the image of man in the earth. 
If God wanted another man, he wouldn't have made Eve. He would not have made the female. He would have made another man, right? And caused them to cohabit and designed them to cohabit and to reproduce. Yes, but it's not the will of God. So the system, the world of darkness promotes this and encourages it. And it is a direct rebellion against the institution of God, for example, of marriage, which is established by God and the family unit, which is established by God. So rebellion grieves the spirit of God. As Isaiah 63 verse 10 teaches us, it grieves the spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. God is incensed by the rebellion of man. And when, although God is tiring long with man, he knows his plan. Man is being given their time and their opportunity and their chance. And so uh, the rebellion grieves the spirit of God. Do not continue to walk in rebellion. You find that you're in disobedience to the word of God. Change your way. Get out of it. It grieves the will. It grieves the spirit of God. And another element of it that is dangerous is that it leads to the hardening of the heart. Hebrews 3 verse 15 speaks about the hardening of the heart of man. And even in Romans 1 where the Bible says that because men would not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. Amen. To reprobation. Yes. When you continue in rebellion against God, whenever we walk in rebellion against God and we continue in it and we refuse to repent and we refuse to change, our hearts become hardened and God will eventually give us over. Because if you will not retain God in your knowledge, God ain't going to fight you. Uh, he says he will not always chide. God ain't going to always be telling you, change your way, change your way. Look here. Amen. This is the right way. Do it the right way. No, he and neither will he keep his anger forever. So God won't always be correcting you. God is going to rebuke and amen, reprove and punish man for his rebellion against him and punish angels for their rebellion against him. They have no hope of forgiveness. They have no hope of repentance. But we have hope of repentance. Children of the Most High God and all those in the audience of this, you have hope. In the day you repent, your sins are forgiven. In the day you repent and believe, the Holy Spirit will fill your vessel. You will speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives you utterance. And not just as a one-off, you will continue to do so from time to time as the Spirit gives you utterance. Yes, there is hope for man. There is no hope for those angels that have defected and that have fallen away. So we have seen examples of rebellion in the Bible through Adam, through Samson. You see the fruit of it. Samson was told that he should never, he knows according to the order of God, that he should never marry anybody who is not a, a Hebrew. Uh, he didn't obey. He go and, and he married uh, uh, somebody who is a Gentile. Right? We look at King Saul. I mentioned him earlier. You look at Jeroboam. He went and constructed idols and... Uh, uh, dealt in uh, all manner of sacrifices uh, that God never ordered, that God never ordained. Rehoboam did the same thing. Uh, amen. And many of the kings of Israel walked in disobedience. Look at the nation of Israel. Amen. They have continually walked in disobedience and in rebellion. Uh, and I want to reiterate this point I made earlier. God is going to protect all those that walk in the kingdom of God, all those that submit to the kingdom of God, all those that align themselves with the kingdom of God and with the will of God. Amen. God is going to protect us. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the kingdom and the kingdom of God is in you. So as long as you are in alignment with God, you must. Obedience is requisite. Obedience is quintessential. You cannot be a, a member of the kingdom of God and walk in disobedience. You will uh, be rejected, okay? And the gates of hell would have prevailed upon you if you end up walking in disobedience. All right. Rebellion is personified in the Bible to, to a woman, right? Uh, a very profound uh, personification of it, if you will. Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab, okay? And we see the characteristics of, the, of a person that is under the influence of a spirit of rebellion. Uh, we have attributed uh, a profound manifestation of the spirit of rebellion uh, that is called Jezebel after the name of the queen that it was profoundly manifested in. Amen. Uh, so we see here that rebellion as manifested through King Queen Jezebel, uh, you see manipulation. You see her calculating nature. You see uh, profound intelligence and visionary behaviorism in, in Jezebel. You see seductiveness and you see persuasiveness. Now, this is, one of the, this is a very profound level of rebellion. So 
uh, this person has allowed themselves to be totally occupied by the spirit of rebellion, to be totally governed by uh, the spirit of Lucifer, if you will. And so you, you, this is not just someone that finds himself in disobedience to God's word, you know, occasionally or inadvertently. Praise the Lord. Well, well nothing is inadvertent, I believe, in the kingdom of God. Um, right? Uh, through acts of will. Amen. This is somebody who has given themselves over. This is like the end game. This is like the nth level of rebellion, so to speak. Jezebel was manipulative. She was calculating. She was very intelligent and used her intelligence in rebellion. She was visionary. Uh, she was seductive and very persuasive. Okay. She usurped authority. Again, notice attack against authority. Right back to the Luciferian inception. Uh, it disdains all authority held by others, right? So the spirit of rebellion, when it, when it has taken over the life of a person, disdains any authority that, it, that the individual does not themselves hold. So you'll find that people, especially in the church, they will disdain a person's authority, a missionary, a minister, an elder, it doesn't matter who, amen. They will always be seeking to upstand somebody, uh, to question their authority, to uh, deride their authority, to question their works, to question what they do. And we've got to be careful of this. Uh, fault finding, amen. And you find fault with everything and you see the er everybody's error except your own, right? And you know the right and best way all the time, every time. Uh, you must be careful. The usurpation of authority is a key manifestation of rebellion. Watch for it. Wickedness was in this woman's heart and in her practice. She was a murderer. She was murderous, right? She murdered the prophets of God, right? And she she destroyed the altars of God, amen, for she was in rebellion. Uh, practice witchcraft. Now, those that are thirsty for power will stop at no length to obtain and utilize power illegitimately, right? So watch for people who would go to the nth degree that will get involved in witchcraft. Uh, all manner of the occult to get power. Amen. They will sell their souls for power. They'll get involved in blood sacrifices and the full gamut of wizardry. Those that go to the Obiaman, amen, to get their God ring and their God pendant and their God this, amen, because they want to have power over other men. Amen. It's uh, some misguided notion that they are seeking protection, uh, Lord Jesus, and the whole shebang of it has to deal with power. Watch those that will use any means to gain power. They are under the power and the authority and the tyranny of rebellion. Those that practice rebellion really well are long-range planners. They are patient with their personal goals. They will go to, to very long lengths to uh, make sure that their schemes are brought to light. Uh, they, they manipulate people. Holy God Almighty. Hallelujah. They... Uh, seek to control people. They, they, they are control freaks. They cannot trust anybody to do anything. They cannot leave anybody to do anything. So you watch the real control freaks, the real micromanagers, those that don't really give space. I'm not talking about people who need to be told and to be corrected when they are not doing things. I'm not talking about the appropriate systems of checks and balances. Not because uh, a person... Uh, what you do now? What is the word I should use? Someone checks and cross checks and uh, monitors and ensures that the system is going well means that they are in rebellion and that they are a Jezebelian in their approach. Not because someone is fastidious and meticulous about what they do means that they are uh, in rebellion. Watch the person that is not walking with alignment with authority, that are not walking according to the covenant of God. Everybody has things to say about others. Oh, he's manipulative. Oh, he is on a power trip. Uh, or she is usurping authority. Or uh, she is too dominant. Or he is uh, uh, too forceful. Uh, check it. Is the person in alignment with the word of God? Are uh, they doing the counsel of God? Are they walking according to the purpose of God in their lives? Are they usurping authority? Are they taking authority from somebody who legitimately uh, should possess it? Are they undermining the kingdom of God? Are they walking by their own self-driven concepts 
or are they under the authority of God or under the authority of somebody that God has delegated such authority to? So you got to be careful. It's not everybody that is uh, demonstrating fastidity. Amen. That is in rebellion. So you watch the against God. Look for those that are pitted against the order of God and the authority that is established by God. Folks that are in full tilt of rebellion are normally abusive, proud, condescending, love the limelight. They love to be seen. They love to be known that they are being seen. They love to be in charge, doing things their way, not in alignment with the will of God and the purposes of God. Amen. They are controllers. They are manipulative. So every one of us now must look to see if these elements are within us. Yeah, are they alive? Are they thriving? Are we walking according? So the major litmus test here, the major plumb line in all of this is the will of God, the word of God. Is the person obeying the voice of God? Are they doing the will of God? Are they following the order of God? Are they operating based on how God says they are to operate? So we have got to watch for these things in our own lives. Are you manipulative to serve your own end against the will of God? Are you seductive to serve your own end against the will of God? Are you practicing witchcraft? Are you praying somebody's demise? Are you demanding their blood? Are you requiring them to be destroyed for you to live? Are you praying their destruction? You got to watch for these things. You got to look out for them. Uh, are you coming against an established authority? Are you fighting against your pastor? Are you fighting against your bishop? All in the name of God too. Are you disdaining the authority held by a minister? Are you castigating your brother in the street to get his position on the board? What are you doing? Right? So we got to look for the seeds of rebellion in our heart. And anytime we are in alignment with disobedience to God and promote it, teach others to do it and seek to get others in aim and disobedience with God, you are in jeopardy of operating under the spirit of rebellion. So we remember Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershom. We remember their end, how they opposed the man of God and what was the result of that op opposition. Amen. Chop, chop. Amen. Time uh, is very important. Now you see how God sees rebellion. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Right? When we walk in rebellion, we are tantamount to being witch, witches and wizards. We are, we are one and the same as those that go seek after familiar spirits that they might obtain advantage in the realm of men. Rebellion is as witchcraft. God says, suffer not a witch to live. It's punishable by death, right? As many other things are in the, in the camp of Israel, right? So uh, stubbornness now, when you are stubborn, when you are implacable, you're intransigent, you're unwilling to be governed by anybody else uh for any other time and for any other reason okay you 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 are a drummer after your own beat all right and you move by your own uh abilities alone you've got to watch for it you cannot walk in stubbornness right because often you will find that when you are wrong you will be stubbornly wrong you will remain wrong you will not be open to correction watch for it right so notice what God says to King to King Saul, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. God rejects rebellion. God rejects stubbornness. Those that are stubborn, you will be rejected. Those that keep, walk in rebellion, you will be rejected of God. God says he sees the proud afar off, but he giveth grace unto the humble. These things resist the kingdom of God in the earth. He resists the, so the kingdom of God is in you first and foremost. So when these things abide in us, the kingdom of God cannot be manifested in our hearts. It cannot be shed abroad. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, the eye, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, all of this, you know, going on, 
but denying the power thereof. From such, what the Bible say? Turn away. Turn away from those who are covetous. Turn away from the boasters. Turn away from the proud. Don't sit with them. Don't eat with them. Don't walk with them. Turn away from the blasphemers, the disobedient to parents. Those who are unthankful and unholy. Don't encourage fellowship with them. Rebuke it. Reprove it. Right? Those who don't have natural affection. Those who are truth makers. Those who are false accusers. Those that are incontinent, fierce, despises of those that are good. Traitors. Don't walk with traitors. Don't, don't deal with them. Correct them. Reprove them. Ah, those that are heady, those that are high-minded, those that are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Those that only have a form of godliness but refuse to walk and live by it. Amen? Don't have fellowship with them. Because you're going to notice, brethren, that at the end of this, not everybody that saith unto the Lord, 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 shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Right? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Remember, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And rebellion is as those who perform witchcraft. Is as witchcraft, as the sin of witchcraft. So, brethren, now, God sees and knows those that are obedient to his word. He is not going to countenance those that are obedient with an ulterior motive because your motive will decide the value of your treasure. If your motives aren't right, if your motives aren't pure, even if you are prophesying and doing the work of God for your own engrandizement, for your own upliftment and not as a worker in the kingdom of heaven and of God. Because many are doing signs and wonders in the name of the Lord. And they will not be saved. Why? Because their lives are in rebellion. Uh, yes, they have the outward show and they have the inward darkness. On the outward they manifest as being light. But inside there is in darkness of uh, the highest merit you can imagine. So we must do the will of God. Not just some of the times. Not just as unto others. but also unto our own lives. Paul says, I, 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 am, I am careful, you know, lest I preach in others and myself become a castaway. I, and it is talking about this kingdom of heaven be like a dragnet. I don't want that when the master comes to examine my fruit and examine my being, he throws me out because I am not in purity. I am not in obedience to his word. Once I am in obedience, then everything in my life will come into alignment. So we must walk in obedience to the word of the Lord. And don't worry about signs and wonders. Because signs and wonders is not what save us. It's the answer of a good conscience towards God. We say yes Lord. We say I will obey thy will. So the antidote for rebellion is obedience. Submission and faith. If we want to win against rebellion. Get obedient to the word of God. And we have to realize. And I've often said this. You do not have to understand what God is asking you to do to do it. Because God is perfect. God is good. God's desire towards you is good and pure. He will never lead you or tell you to do something that is self-destructive. Yes? He will tell you to do something that is eternally uplifting and eternally transcendent for you. God will tell you what to do for the good of your life now and for the good of your life in eternity. So we don't always have to understand to obey. In fact, it is not required. Understanding is not requisite when it comes to God to obey. You must obey. Obedience, faith is requisite to obey. Because in order for me to do what I cannot understand, in order for me to do what I cannot see beyond, I must believe. And that's why he that cometh to God, he that seeketh to approach God, must believe that he exists, first of all, and must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently please him. For what? Without faith, it is impossible. Impossible. It is impossible to please God. So to please God is to obey him. And to obey him requires faith, brethren. Uh, Abraham, take the boy and go offering him up to me. Look here. For Abraham had to believe God in order to obey. And so it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Not his understanding, but his obedience to what the will of God required of him in that moment. Right? The same thing is true for us. For you to obey, you have to believe about Shia. You have to believe what God is asking you to do. My brother, my sister. And in order to obey, you have to submit. 
You got to submit your desires. You got to submit your appetites, your passions, your powers. Amen. You've got to submit your faculties. You got to submit your will to God. Because in order to obey, you have to be submitted to the Lord Most High. And what greater thing is there? Praise the Lord. The Bible says in Isaiah 1 verse 19 to 20, If you be obedient, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. God was talking to Israel. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. If you will be willing, that means if you have the good desire, if you have what? The ability to submit, not being stubborn. When you, the, the opposite of stubbornness is willingness, is being willful, right? Is being willing, is being uh, congenial to do the thing, right? So if you are willing and obedient, so if you are not stubborn and not disobedient, then you shall eat the good of the land. The good of the land is in the present and the good of the land is in the future. The good of the land is in the temporal, in the physical world, and the good of the land is also in the spiritual world. But if you refuse, right, if you are stubborn and you rebel, that is you're disobedient, you shall be devoured. I don't want to be devoured. I don't want to be destroyed. I want to be a successful heir of the kingdom. And my brethren, my brothers and my sisters, I adjure you by the mercies of God and I encourage you. Amen. By the cloud of witnesses that have been uh, written off in the canon of the Bible that you submit. You submit as James 4 verse 7 says, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Remember now that it is God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But you and I have got to work out our own salvation. In other words, you've got to walk it out. You have got to act it out. You have got to select to do what God has given you the energy and the capacity to do already. Look, let us go forth into this world. Go forth into your life. Practice obedience. Practice submission. And believe all the way. And the devil will have no room in you. God bless you. Until next time when we will be able to share. This is your brother Bishop Agri Scott saying good evening. And... Seek out if there is any shred of rebellion in you. The songwriter says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, I pray. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be some wicked way in me and cleanse me from every sin and set me free. God bless you. Till such time.